I'm going to talk about the EHDS today, the European Health Data Space, and specifically I'm also going to dive into the so-called secure processing environments uh, a little bit more. Yeah, so as you can see from the agenda already, the EHDS has two main parts. One is concerned with the primary use of health data and one is concerned with the secondary use of electronic health data. Uh, but within the definition of the EHDS regulation, so the law text, the primary use actually only covers the provision of healthcare. So um, we could also talk about primary use of data as like research data that is collected specifically for research purposes, but these data do not fall under the regulation at all, basically, which is also something relevant to know. And the focus of the presentation is going to be within the secondary use of health data, because uh, for research, this is the of the main relevance. And there I'm going to give a brief overview. I'm going to try to explain to you how an application for data will look under the secondary use of health data. I will explain a little bit about the secure processing environment, and then I will also go into some details and some problems of problems of like other specifics of this secondary use mechanism. So the primary use of health data, I'm just going to explain very briefly. So uh, you have like an idea of what is in the regulation because the commission decided to put the primary use of health data and the secondary use the same regulation. I will follow the structure basically here. Um, so the primary use of health data mainly is concerned with the introduction of obligatory European electronic health records. Uh, the EHR is short for electronic health records and not for European health records, as I was told yesterday, and I confused it myself here. And um, so such an electronic health record will, I think, to explain it, basically, it's kind of like a, a like a, a software and infrastructure combined basically for like a like a patient um, summary record something like this and it will have at least two mandatory components which is like the so-called lodging component which will have to provide specific services so uh, it has to provide like an access service for healthcare professionals so that they can access the health record, but also can insert specific data into the uh, health record. But it also has to provide for a interoperability component. Uh, so if you provide for like a software where a EHR can be accessed and used, uh, you also have to provide for the possibility of your software to uh, interoperable, be interoperable with other similar software, so that like the goal of um, that like they have with like cross-border data exchange, so like a health data, uh, a health professional, for example, in Portugal can also uh, access health data in Germany can be achieved. And within this system, there is like a mandatory opt-out for patients. So member states have to give patients the opportunity to not use this electronic health records, and they also implement some specific rights to natural persons, uh, for example, like the right to po uh, data portability, something new, and also the right to know who accesses your data. Um, so now to the secondary use of health data. Uh, the general idea behind this uh, secondary use of health data mechanism is basically that for specific public purposes, you can go to anybody who holds health data, basically, and ask them uh, to give the data to you. And health data in this way is defined in a very broad way. You have like the personal health data, which is like data that directly relates to the health of a natural person. But you also have anonymous health data, which can for example, also maybe be like environmental uh, factors when we talk about exposome research. So it's really like a very broad concept of health data that is like uh, in the regulation. Um, yeah, and research, of course, is like one of the purposes for which this data accesses to electronic health data can be granted. 
And there's, of course, like a corresponding duty for anybody who holds data to make this data then available to you. And data holding is not only meant as the person who actually has the data on his or her server or computer, but anybody who has like access to, to data. So even if you have like a data center somewhere in the US, but you, it's still like the data you can access, you are still considered like a data holder within the EHDS. And the decision whether or not you will have access to this data, different from what is the situation now most of the time, is not made by the person who actually holds the data, but by the health by the so-called health data access body, which will be like a national authority who will decide over such data accesses. And they will usually grant access to the data in a so-called secure processing environment, an SPE. Um, yes, and here I'll try to make the, the system of like uh, how a data application works a little bit more uh, understandable. Uh, can you not? No. Can I not show something here? No. Okay, anyways. So on, like you have the data user and you have a data holder on the right and the left. And like how the system nowadays would mainly be that like the data user would go to the data holder and ask him or her, can I have your data? And then they would have to come some come to some kind of agreement. But the way it will be under the EHDS is that you actually go directly to the data access body, so like a public authority, and you say, hey, I have this in this project, I want to use uh, the data that I know this and this other body has for my uh, research project, and then the data access body will either deny or will grant you the data access, and if they grant you, they will give you like a data permit uh, where they specifically tell you which way you are allowed to use the data and which data you will have access to. And then we'll, they will request the data from the data holder, which is not something the data holder can then make a decision on by themselves, but it's like a mandatory request. And they will have to transfer the data to the SPE provider or the SPE directly. And there the data user can use the electronic health data. And the SPE and the data access body, how they are related is like, something that is like a little bit uncertain now, so <laughs> I put different dots there, but it can also be that the SPE will just be a part of the data access body or there will be like private providers that's still like uncertain. Yes. Uh, it's <laughs> the SPE is like, a, what, is it, what is it in general? It's like an environment for like secure data analysis. analysis. I put it twice because it's very important to know. Um, and the, the idea basically is, if you look at the um, EHDS, I feel like a lot of people are very surprised and like they ask why, why are they doing it like this? You know, it's like, because it's a very big shift from like the GDPR where if you want to use unconsented health data, it can be very tricky, right? I mean, I feel like most of you probably made this <laughs> experience already that like, data protection authorities very skeptical about this a lot of times. And now with the EHDS, you not only have a general right basically to use unconsented health data for research purposes, but you even have like a right to ask this data from like uh, another person who maybe the controller of the data may has like ethical <laughs> problems with saying, okay, I got this data, I didn't ask for approval to give it to somebody else for research, and now I'm like kind of forced to then repurpose the data, give it to somebody else so that they can make the research on it. And I think like the, the, the idea the, the European Commission ha had when they introduced the EHDS was kind of that the secure processing environment replaces the necessity for like a strict data protection assessment basically, because they, at the end of the day, they consider it's like as something like quasi anonymous because it's like a black box where the data goes in, you get like an anonymous result out and what happens inside is like processing of per, like personal data, but nobody can see what's going on there. And I think this is like the concept they had. And this is why uh, the, the SBE 
uh, have to be able to restrict asset, uh, access to only like authorized personnel, which also uh, goes hand in hand with some form of certification that you need uh, some kind of like a trusted certification system on who can get into this uh, um, environment. And it also should, on a technical level, restrict the removal or copying of data from the secure processing environment to an outside source. And uh, and it should like lock also like all activities within. It should control what data is brought into the secure processing environment as well as what goes out. But at the same time, it should allow for state of the art data analysis. And um, this is like how they describe it basically in the law. But um, like my experience so far is that if you talk to people, how is it actually like supposed to work? How will you how is like a software supposed to check what data goes in? How is software to control what data goes out? How do we actually define anonym anonymity on a technical level? And how is the software to supposed to know what data is anonymous? Where anonymity is like a very relative concept, right? So um, I think there's like still like a lot of uncertainties. And I think like that the secure processing environment for me it still seems very unsure how they how they want to make it happen, and <laughs> they like what what they like what my experience so far is that they always tell me, uh, but it works in Finland. They have to fin data, and all this EHDS system is based on a Finnish system. And it was fun also yesterday to talk with uh, some of the Finnish people here to also see that the conviction that it works so well in Finland is not apparently so popular with the people working on it in Finland. So, yes. So, but there's also like other specifics, of course, uh, except like from the data, uh, application and secure processing environment specifically. Um, something I didn't mention here is that also um, that like the data uh, the age steps so the health data access bodies, their job is also to keep like a metadata catalog of all the available data sets. So if you hold a health data set, basically, you have the duty to report this to the health data access body in your national country. So they can uh, have like a kind of registry of all the health data sets, which is also like a little bit of like a weird thing because if you define health data according with this regulation, the EHDS regulation. Health data is everything that relates to health, and you know, in a way, everything can relate to health. So it's also something that seems very unclear to me. Where do you draw the line, you know? It's like, so do all car manufacturers now have to report their manufacturing plans to, to the HDAP because what the car pollutes in the environment also affects the health, you know? It's uh, something that's like a very broad term and therefore also like a little bit unclear. Yes, but something that's like, I think, good to know also for researchers is that data sharing under different uh, mechanisms, for example, like contractual agreements, uh, bilateral agreements, research uh, projects uh, will be unaffected by the EHDS. It specifically allows uh, data sharing under existing mechanisms to continue. Um, and the... Um, Secondary use also has a mandatory opt-out, so uh, it has to allow for patients to opt out of their data being repurposed. Um, but in limit case, there's like a so-called override of the opt-out, so in emergency situations, uh, the data, even when there's an opt-out, can still be used um, for uh, the public purposes that are allowed in the secondary use part of the HDS. Um, and also private entities are included in the HDS, both as data holders and as data users. So for example, like pharma companies can also ask for access to electronic health data, but also can be, act, can be approached to grant access to their health data that they hold, which 
also, I talked with some people like working for pharma companies that find this like very disturbing that they also have to share their data with other pharma companies, for example, which is a, also like a little bit of a weird situation that they have to share their data with each other now. And they tried to, they had, they put some basically data, like they put some rights to like intellectual property rights in the EHDS regulation, but intellectual property rights have like a very limited protection of data actually because data is not intellectual property. It does not belong to you when you collect it. It still like basically belongs to the person that it stems from. So it's a little bit tricky when it comes to like personal electronic health data to protect it with intellectual property. I think they tried to do it, but it didn't really succeed in my opinion. And we'll have to see how it goes. Uh, also like national systems for ethical approval uh, are unaffected, so uh, it doesn't change, the EHDS doesn't change anything about it. Basically, same in a gen more general way goes also, also for like data protection authorities, but it says so in the regulation, but I mean it grants also you the right to access and process personal electronic health data, so there's like an impact on uh, data protection authority approval in a way for certain. And it also has a system, like a simplified procedure. So for trusted, data, uh, trusted health data holders, um, I think what they had in mind was probably like specific. In Germany, for example, we have um, a, a body basically that is responsible for all the data sharing between university hospitals. And I think they wanted to have like a they want to support system like this, but it's called simplified procedure. But at the end of the day, the, the trusted the health data holder can make a decision, but it always has to be um, the final decision is always with the health, health data access bodies. So actually, like there has to be two decisions then, which I'm not sure if it really is like a simplified procedure, but we'll have to see. And there's also fees for uh, for asking for the data, but these fees should only cover the administrative costs of making the data available to you and not for like the original gathering of the data. And is also allowed to make for national countries to make specific um, exceptions from the from the EHDS, but only concerning genetic, genomic uh, and biobanking data as well as uh, data from wellness apps. So Fitbits and the such is, I think is meant with wellness uh, apps. And I think something that's like very problematic also in relation to uh, the opt out, for example, is that there's like really no provisions on like record linkage in the EHDS. And if you think about how an opt out for the secondary use of health data is supposed to work without you having any form of like, in some countries, for example, I think Denmark, they have like a unified identifier for like uh, health data. But in Germany, we, for example, we don't have something like this. So how are you then supposed to opt out of your data usage when you don't have a identifier? You also usually don't work with clear data. So how do you link the opt out to the health data that you, that you are using? And it specifically says that you are not supposed to re-identify data just to make an opt-out work, basically. But then how is the opt-out supposed to work? That's also something that seems still very unclear to me. And in a more general sense, um, I'm not sure if like the EHDS will convince data protection authorities, for example, that record linkage is possible and feasible, although you have the, the right to access data, basically. It's still like something where I could see them basically getting their foot in the door and saying, you can access data, but there's not, it doesn't say that you're allowed to do the record linkage. So that's all something we, we have to see. And yeah, there's like system for sanctioning. Uh, like if you, do, for example, do not stick to your data permit or something like this, that's very similar to the GDPR. So I think fines up to 20 million or in bad cases, up to 4% of your annual revenue. And yeah, it will enter into force June 2028, which might seem like a long time, but I think, 
I'm skeptical about if this will be on time, basically, because it also relies on the primary use being done first, basically, in a way, because the data access should also cover electronic health records. But this will also be implemented in June 2028. So, and four years, I think we have seen in this field is not a lot of time, and we have to see if it works out. Yeah, I already covered like some of the, the issues that I see. I think specifically like the SPEs, if we actually will have a system of like working secure processing environment that both have the opportunity for like large scale big data analysis, maybe also with like artificial intelligence in four years being possible in them. Uh, I'm not so sure if that will be possible and if people will not rather stick to their to like data analysis and data sharing on their own terms, basically outside of the EHDS. And yes, I think this is like the, these are like our main points and also I think I'm over the time already. So the rest I already touched. So yes, thank you.